wanted to know which planet was causing your suffering? Hmm... How about Earth? Hey everyone, Brandplex here, back with a new Duels of Eden video. For today's video, I want to talk about a concept that you've probably run into if you're playing Celsi in this game, or if you've even played Celsi in One Step from Eden, and that concept is going to be step spells or invade combos. And the reason why I want to talk about these specifically is because they're actually available to any character in the game if you use spells like Step Slash, Auto Slash, Reverse Step, or stuff like Step Lance. But since Celesty is the girl with the um, invade weapon on her kit, a lot of players don't realize that this is actually something you can use game-wide or character-wide. And it's a very useful way to kind of expand your aggression and your deck pool because you have access to spells that you wouldn't think you would have normally. And so... Uh, for this video, ironically enough, I'll just be using Celsi to show all these combos, but just be aware again that there's a reason why I use um, Step Slash and Auto Slash on my Saffron deck, and it's because I'm using this same concept but on different characters so that I can get these other spells used properly. And so, if you know nothing about Step Combos, basically, or Invade rather, it's essentially when you go to the enemy side of the board and use spells there to attack them and extend the hitbox. So Celsi obviously is the main user of this because she has Fair Frozen on her first weapon. And I just want to talk about the bonuses and the reason why you should be really aware of these combos, even if you don't use them yourself, because a lot of players will use them the higher up you go. And it's a very, very powerful concept in the game because it offers so much more versatility in deck building and combo, orient or not combo orientation, but combo um, availability. And so just to go over the very, very basic rules, when you invade, you will always be able to move twice on the enemy side of the field. But if you move twice, then you're forced to run back to your side of the field. You can also move once and cast an ability, but after you cast that one ability, you will also be forced to move back. You can't buffer a second movement after casting that spell. The game will just make you run backwards automatically. And then if you're only moving once, or if you don't move at all after using the step spell, Depending on the spell, you can actually use two spells, but if the spell is too slow, then you can only use one spell. So just jumping ahead in the video a little bit, something like Shear, you can see that even though I'm buffering Breakout, I can't use Breakout while I'm on the other side because Shear's frame data just physically doesn't allow that to happen. And so that's really important because, again, you have a lot of spells that are very melee in nature. Breakout and Crossfire are both spells that are very close range compared to stuff like projectile spells such as minigun, javelin, or kunai, or even spells like thunder and magic claw. These are all spells that reach very far and are technically universal in range, but they might be hard to land because, you know, your opponent moves a lot. Whereas with breakout and crossfire, if you're within melee range, you can often rely on it hitting your opponent just because it is a bit more forgiving, it's just much more limited in applicability. And that's the reason why M-Date is so good, because you can actually avoid, or rather, um, overcome that quote-unquote limited range by going to your opponent's side of the field, and now you can combo in places that you wouldn't be able to combo unless your opponent was in melee range. And so another really important aspect of step combos is that, is rather how it affects your spell's frame data. So right here, um, in the top of the screen, you can see this gap icon. My mouse is turned off right now on my OBS, but you can see at the very top next to the combo damage above the opponent's health bar, basically, there's a gap number, and that essentially tells you whether, or that tells you how much frames you get from landing a combo. So if I land Breakout into Crossfire, you can see that it says negative 10. So that means that this combo is true by negative 10 frames, which means that there were 10 frames before the opponent could even do anything. And that's important to note, because if I were to step from the back row and then cast Breakout and Crossfire, you can see it's now gap minus 15, which means that my Breakout, um, the frame lockout or frame data lockout from Breakout has been shortened by 5 frames. And that opens up a lot of interesting combos, because that means that certain things that were ordinarily not possible are now possible. And so we'll actually just go ahead and show a really good example of that um, right here. So usually push slash Ragnarok, there's a gap of six, which means that your opponent can dodge or walk out of it. But if I have um, Push Slash and Ragnarok, you can see that's now a gap of three, which means that my opponent can no longer dash out of it or walk out of it because they'll be tagged by the ending hitbox of Ragnarok. They also can't dodge it, which means that they have to either, they have to shield it basically to reduce damage, which is a shield break, which can be very detrimental. And obviously Push Slash Ragnarok is kind of a weird one to show, but um, it's just the best example I can show you guys because there is such a big difference with the, I guess, accessibility of the combo. And you might have noticed that I talked about earlier how 
um, steps force you to go back to your own side of the field. But if you step onto your, if you rather use a step spell and then you walk on your side, you no longer have to return. And so that's true um, no matter how far you walk onto the enemy side. As long as you make it back to your side of the field, the game won't force you back. And that's why it's really interesting to use your steps from the back of your field because that also, again, opens up combos that you weren't normally able to pull off, such as push slash Ragnarok, because, you know, if you're on the other side, you know, you're forced to return, or if you're just in the front, you just can't pull it off because the frame day is not good enough. But just being aware of the fact that you can use step slash from the back row and then combo, it's really interesting how much it opens up. And again, you have to move if you use step slash from the back end. If you just like kind of not move at all, then you're still forced to return. You do have to input a movement to cancel that return. And so with Ragnarok out of the way, all these spells are just spells that I want to show you guys because they're very applicable. Again, they're usually very melee, but you can see how we can use them to, we can use step and invade rather to extend their hitboxes and make them a bit more universally accessible. So like Sheer usually wouldn't be able to push past the first three rows, but by stepping in, I can actually get the bonus damage, which is really, really nice. Same thing with Shotgun. Shotgun's first two rows usually, but if I push in, I get the sweet spot, which is again, super nice. And then again, if you've been playing a lot of um, Celsi and One Step from Eden, you'll also might be, a be aware of uh, Auto Slash. And so if you, you can actually chain step spells into each other and they'll let you stay on the enemy side of the field for way longer. So if I put in step slash now, I can combine step slash into, uh, or rather, I can, yeah, I can combine step slash with fair frozen and then auto slash. And you can see how long I'm on the enemy side of the field for. And so that can be a really um, pesky way to play the game because especially with lower level opponents, they won't know how to respond to somebody who's just constantly on the other side of the field. And so, well, my friends um, who kind of like hopped in at some point uh, back in the beta, this is how he annoyed me because he would just run around and use spells that essentially kept me, kept him on his, my side of the field. So he would use like step slash and then fair froze and reverse. And you can just see how long you can be on the other side. And I didn't push these over here. So let me just do this properly so you guys can see the exact shenanigans that can happen so it's like step slash fair frozen and then you just stay over here the entire time and you just see like how obnoxious that can be in a real game because you're like trying to hit your opponent but there's not on the right side of the field and again the way the reason why that concept works is because you can chain invade spells into each other but once again, it does follow the exact same rule as I said earlier, where you can only move once depending on the spell. Like, you have to remember that you can't, there's no rules being broken with another invade spell. You do still have to respect the, oh, you can only move once to hit it. And then that subsequent invade spell, I think, inherits um, the same idea as the initial invade. So, if you use another invade spell after the first invade spell, you can kind of move twice, but depending on how long you're on the other side of the field, sometimes you can't do other combos so just i would suggest as lobbing these out as much as you can because the rules can change really easily from spell to spell and you just want to be aware of what you're getting into before you start really getting invested in something that you haven't checked and so again all slash is really useful because you can go step into auto slash and then extend all of your hitboxes and i guess something that i should mention is that you also want to be careful of what spell you're using because sometimes the spells will just go off the map and then not do anything so you can see fire breath is just doing absolutely nothing and there's another spell like that uh called tri thunder but we'll talk about tri thunder when we get there so fire breath um the actual usage is just to obviously extend your hitbox and you can see that i'm getting a lot of value off of it even though um, I mean, a lot of value that I wouldn't normally be able to get out of it because I can now true combo into it and I hit my opponent with it. And then obviously with auto slash, I can use auto slash with fire breath. You can see that's also a combo. And that's the reason why I want to talk about this combo because using step slash into auto slash is a very easy way to guarantee eight damage. Maybe more if you have more. So like, for example, I can use step slash auto slash into fire breath and that's going to be a solid 13 damage that the opponent is going to take for sure because they're in hits on the entire time and the only way they can play around that is by avoiding the step slash and then the auto slash following up afterwards and then trying to punish you as you return to your tile which you can uh get out of by using dodge which is an advanced tip that you can explore in your own time <laughs> so with all that aside, again, more spells like Entangle, more spells like Sweeper, Salvo, Mistletoes, and 
Oh, super solvable mistletoe. So these spells, again, step spells or NBA combos are very interesting because they actually give you better frame data, as I mentioned earlier. Just like how I showed you guys earlier with like the push slash Ragnarok, it also applies a sweeper and salvo. So sweeper and salvo are generally very laggy abilities, but instead of being stuck to your tile, you can always mix up your um, sweeper slash salvo casts by using them after a step combo. So like here, I can force my opponent to respect my step combo or force them to try and look for a counter. And then I can either mind game them by running to the other corner and casting sweeper and hitting them and surprising them. Or I can just go for the step slash and the sweeper. And if they're on the front rows because they're trying to be aggressive and they don't realize I have sweeper, then that's a true combo or nearly true combo in the sweeper that they might not be aware of. And if your opponent is a bit more fresh to the game, then they're gonna be hit by that and not shielded in time because they're being they're too distracted by the fact that you just stepped and they're casting other abilities and so that's again very applicable with salvo you just cast a salvo during your step and that gives you the frame data and a bit more flexibility with how you're going to escape because you can even uh again you can cover your cast you can cover your approach you can do a lot of stuff you can even just salvo into step slash and do more with that and again this is just a spell that really covers a lot of it just enables all the flexibility that you wouldn't normally have in the game and then the most infamous combo that has been nerfed quite heavily since the testing days, but is still a very good way to get 10 damage very easily, is going to be Step Slash Mistletoe, or All Slash Mistletoe, or, you know, Fair Pose and Mistletoe. And this combo is just very good because if you manage to tag the, uh, the step, you'll almost always get the uh, next two missiles on top of them for free, unless they uh, hit step the initial step, which will be a defensive concept that I'll cover in a future video. But you can see just like, it, you can see that I do get a little bit of time to follow up the uh, missiles, which is the reason why it was nerfed so much, because it used to have a much greater grace period to allow you to follow up. But something with Thunder, like Thunder, obviously we all know is a very precise spell, and it's actually kind of hard to hit Thunder most of the time. But with set missiles, if you have Thunder in your hand, if you're fast enough, you can actually walk and then get Thunder afterwards. It's a very good way to have these very precise cards be a bit more consistent because you have a little bit of flexibility to hit it, and that way those cards will feel less bad to have in your deck. And so with those basic spells out of the way, we can talk about spells that have a bit more interesting um, properties with steps. So you can also use projectiles when you're stepping, and it's not really much... Um, it's not really like much of a, I guess, like deal breaker or um, eye opener to use projectiles while you're stepping. But it's just to be aware of that because if you have projectiles in your hand, then you can always just be aware, like, oh, I can dump my spells in and then get them out and then just increase my punish for my opponent. And then you can see like North Wind, I can use North Wind with that. But it's a bit different because only certain projectile spells will allow you to continue comboing after you hit that spell. So this is a good time to mention this. So, channeled spells when you step. They'll continue to keep going after you step. So you can see, like, when I um, use step minigun, uh, I'm just gonna do a better example. Like, I can actually. Oh, is Fair Frozen actually not the best? Uh... I'm gonna have to wait a little bit for minigun to show the exact properties. But with stuff like minigun, if you cast it late enough, you can usually move the hitbox a little bit. Uh, I think it's immediately. That's weird. I must be going crazy, but. um. <laughs> I don't want to do a retake, so just, just I'll just show it on uh, triple barrel. So with projectile spells that are channeled, you can you can see like move the uh, hitbox around, and so that can be really trippy for your opponent because they might expect you to move your spells around. So something like unleash again, if I use a step combo, since I've been since I use a step combo, the game lets me continue moving after. My my spell is cast, so very similar to how Unleash, or rather, to how Sweeper and Salvo worked. Since it cancels my anchor, as people have called it in this game, I'm allowed to move around and redirect Unleash. So Unleash goes from a spell that is kind of useless if you whiff it, because like, oh, I whiff, so I'm just standing here the entire time, to a spell that you can actively move around and like hit your opponent even if they dodge if you're fast enough to read it. And so, again, um, I, you guys might have seen me talk about how when you return, like, it kind of stops you from doing stuff. Like, I mentioned Mistletoes as a good way to extend your combo afterwards. And Minigun and Triple Barrel, like, all those spells are also good ways to extend your 
time to punish off of a confirmed step because it anchors for so long that you can actually follow up with other spells in time. So it's a again, minigun is also very good with steps if you want to do it that way. It's just being aware of what your options are. And so again, triple barrel. Knife is another projectile that you can use with that. Triple barrel is an example of the projectile being funky if you want to be funky with it. And then a line is something that, again, can be comboed off of step spells. A line's a funny spell because it's actually reactable. It's very powerful um, for stuff like Ragnarok and Thunder because it forces your opponent into a place where you can punch them with those spells. And if you use uh, step slash, it ends up making it very hard to dodge because maybe they're Maybe they're expecting you to cast it from here, which gives them a bit of time to dodge it. But if you step and hit them, then it's no longer an option. And so the next few, I think it's only a few more that I want to show. So Apprehend um, apprehends a spell that will pull your enemy to the tile right in front of you. And what's weird about that is depending, because of how the game calculates your location, this can drastically change. So like here you can see that it pulled them to the front, but if I use it too soon, um, you can see that instead of pulling them to the front, it pulls to where I was during the invade. And then there are even certain frame periods where it doesn't move them at all because the game has no idea where I am. So just to be aware of that, like if you're trying to use these type of spells, you want to know, you want to like be aware of how fast or like how you want to buffer them just to get the most value. Same thing with, okay, and stuff like Blink and Rush, these spells that will forcibly adjust your um, location. So when you use Blink, you might be like, oh, like, Step Blink should be good because it's a small projectile that's really fast. The issue with Blink is that it actually ends your action window with Step. You can see that I kind of cast something at the very end here. And you can continue casting spells, but since it forces you to the back, like, unless your opponent is in the back, then you won't be able to do much afterwards. And then same thing with stuff like Rush. Um, Rush is a funny spell because if you if you if if there's nothing in front of you, then it'll force you all the way to the back of your opponent's uh, map. But if, if, if there's something in front of you, then it'll stop it properly. So stuff like Rush, like let's say I'm trying to hit my opponent like diagonally like this. In the past, Rush would just explode where the Solsky was standing and give me the damage. But since it's been changed, it forces me all the way to the back. So in order to get Rush damage, your opponent either has to be on the back column or you have to collide with them. So you can see that here, I get the Rush combo. But if I'm standing here, I wouldn't. And then Shadow Step is another one of those funky spells that actually will bring you back to where your initial tile was. So you can see that since I started my step on this corner, Shadow Step will always bring me there. But since I'm stepping, it still memorizes where my column is because it thinks I'm going to return there. So it will bring me all the way back. And it's really interesting and really trippy. So like if I stand on this corner, it'll bring me to the uh, middle left, top middle left of my grid. And so it's another way of just making your hitbox very slippery because your opponent might not expect that. And then other stuff, uh, Acid Rain is kind of similar to Minigun and Triple Barrel where the uh, hitbox will adjust actively depending on where you are when you cast it because of how long its casting time is. So if your opponent is like, trying to like a dodge acid rain you can manipulate it to make it hard to dodge but also be aware that if you are manipulating the hitbox then you don't want to accidentally let your opponent get out of the hitbox because you stepped out and then now you obviously missed the other hit and so the last step spells are just going to be the conditional step spells so these are spells that are going to mostly be things that only hit a certain tiles away so stuff like ice pick you can see that it only hits two tiles away but if I step and go into the back, you can see that it actually hits the back row. And that's not necessarily going to be true for every um, one of these spells. Like, if I go with Tri Thunder and as we saw with Fire Breath earlier, certain spells that will hit a certain amount, certain amount of tiles away don't have the privilege of getting the cast on the last row just for, I guess, like design reasons. You can see Tri Thunder, um, it casts three Thunders, three, four, five tiles away. But if I cast it in the back row, you don't even get a sound effect because it's going off the map. So those spells aside, every other spell that I've chosen is a spell that will lock to the back row. So don't be too wary of that. So stuff like um, Ice Pick, obviously, if you're, gonna be, if you're aware enough, you can like walk backwards and cast it and still get the combo off. And then obviously you can just use it normally. And I didn't include Auto Slash here, but a really cool thing with, with Ice Pick is that it actually combos very well with Auto Slash because Auto Slash will push them one back and they can just hold Ice Pick afterwards and get that guaranteed if your opponent doesn't hit step. And that's going to be true for a, different, a few other spells I'll probably show later. 
And so like stuff like Lasso, Lasso is a four way spell, so you can only it will only land four tiles away. But if you're using steps, you can actually just cast it there and it'll pull your opponent back with you. Slowball is another funny spell because it's um a spell that is, as its name implies, very slow. But if you notice where it spawns, if I go frame by frame, you can see it spawns right in front of me. So what you can do is you can just use a step spell and then walk on it, like walk in front of your opponent, and then slow ball will now suddenly be a spell that's undodgeable or even a true combo. So if you have like 20 spears, now you can guarantee a 26 damage spell because again, if you have auto slash, let's say you're using auto slash, you can auto slash walk forward slow ball, and then your opponent either if you're fast enough, you buffer the movement in a cast, they're going to be forced to take that damage, and that's going to be a really easy way to confirm a spell that is otherwise really hard to hit. And then uh, Whirl. Uh, Whirl is very funny because Whirl is the singular spell, or not singular, but there's very few spells that do this, but it's a spell that drags your opponent. So if you hit Whirl, obviously I've been mentioning hit step a lot, and that means your opponent can walk away, but if you use Whirl, they're actually forced to be pulled back with you. And that means that, like, if I use Whirl here, you can see that I can actually move them around. So if I use Whirl, um, yeah, you can see that they get pulled back. If I wait a little bit longer, you can see that I can drag them all the way up. So that's really fun to, like, use it on bombs or on other people. And just you can really mess with them by pulling them around on a string. Barricade, Magic Claw, Paragon, Ragnarok are all very similar to Ice Pick. Um, you can cast them on the back and they'll all just be there. And... Yeah, it's just being aware because these spells are all X aways, so they can only be cast a certain distance from you. And then with step spells, obviously, if you step too far, like I step even on the second first row, then they'll always be on the back row. So you have to be aware of that because maybe your maybe your opponent's on the third row or the second row, and you're like stepping onto them to do damage. These spells are a bit more conditional because you actually can't do anything about that unless you cast it where you're supposed to be. And then I think the last set of spells I already covered just happens oh yeah i didn't even include them but yeah um for the frame data i was talking about you might have noticed that with sheer i briefly covered it but basically the way that all these spells work is that there is a condition for them to be cast so you can just go ahead and do one last show of that and basically the way you know if a step spell can be cast can have multiple follow-ups is dependent on how long the recovery is. So the moment the recovery is past 20 total, you can no longer cast another spell afterwards. So something like, let's say, Bouncing Blade, you can cast Bouncing Blade and still cause a follow-up. But if I, if I think, it's like if the, uh, yeah, you can just cast it in general. But if it's something like Armor Drop, which is 20 recovery, then I can no longer cast a follow-up. So we'll use Acid Rain as the, um, like, um, like the spell to show off that I can use something afterwards. So again, Bouncing Blade, recovery of 19, I can cast the uh, Acid Ring afterwards. But if I were to use Armor Drop... Oh, I can still do it. So maybe it's a little more. I thought I did the math earlier, so I didn't bother double-checking, but it's somewhere between 20, 21, or 22 was the threshold of um, being able to cast. And just like... Uh, to be fully aware, when you see, so like Mistletoe has a recovery of 18, but you have to notice that it has something called mid frame data, which essentially extends its recovery a bit longer, which is why you can't use Mistletoe and something else. So, looks like it's 22 recovery. That's the breakpoint. So at 22 recovery, you can no longer cast another spell. So let's make sure that I'm not going insane. This is a very awkward end to the video, but it's a very long video and I don't have time to do another recording, so I'm just trying to figure out where the, uh, <laughs> where the point is, where, that's weird. Is it because Bouncing Blade's too short? Huh. Well, you can just trust me, so like, I, I can just show Acid Rain again, right? Like, Acid Rain, I can't cast Shield Throw afterwards. But if I use Shield Throw, then I use Acid Rain. So, again, there's a certain threshold in recovery that you can no longer use spells after. And again, I thought I thought it was shorter than what it is now, but it must be longer than I expected. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's definitely like, Sheer is the definitive threshold for it. Maybe it's Flame Breath, let's see. Yeah, so 
Flame Breath at 24 frames. That's, that's the definitive ending of when you can cast a follow-up spell. So if you're trying to lab combos with um, step spells, that's just something you want to be aware of. So you can do like Power Drain into um, Break Shot if you want to, because both Power Drain and Break Shot are barely, barely short enough recovery before you cast both. So you can do it, you can combo like this, but then if you want to combo something like Sheer instead, like Sheer Minigun, you're never going to be able to because Sheer will force you back into where you came from because of how long the recovery is. So uh, happy testing. Hopefully this video was helpful. If it wasn't, please let me know. But otherwise, hopefully you guys had a great day or night wherever you are. And see you guys next time. Bye-bye.